Okay, so as I said, 9.3 is getting into how do we control the cell cycle? And um, I, I wanted to show you this slide. I mentioned that, you know, when we're talking about cell division, that not every cell divides at the same frequency. Uh, meaning, like, if you're a skin cell or, um, you know, the, the types of cells that, like, make up your outside skin, they're actually very similar cells that would line up your digestive tract. And that kind of makes sense because it's, like, the cells of your, like, the inner part of, like, say, your esophagus, small intestine, they all are, like, kind of exposed to somewhat similar, they, they almost have a similar job. They're trying to form that barrier. And, like, your small intestine and, your, you know, your stomach, your large intestine, you're going to have to repair those cells very, very often because of the nature of their job. They're being, they're constantly, be, like, dealing with, like, you know, digesting food and some of the chemicals that go into digestion. Whereas if you compare, um, you know, like uh, more muscle type cells, they're gonna be super, super long lived. And most of your muscle cells can't divide. Um, maybe like your red blood cells, they're gonna last up to 120 days. And why would that make sense? Why would you not, like why would you want your red blood cells to be like longer lasting than say like skin cells? Why might that kind of make sense? But it's you. Yeah, like if they only lasted like a couple of days, like you'd have to be like, there'd be a lot of turnover and that would just not be very efficient. So anyways, you don't have to memorize the lifespan of these cells. It's just kind of more of um, just something to keep in mind. What I, would, what I would want you to memorize is that nerve and muscle cells, generally speaking, don't divide and that the skin cells are going to be dividing the most. That would be kind of understanding those extremes. Uh, so... And then cancer cells, what happens in cancer is basically you get a cell that um, loses like the normal controls that control the cell cycle that I'll go over. Cancer cells just stop responding to those. They kind of lose out on the social cues um, that like manage when a cell is going to uh, uh, grow or not grow or divide or not divide. And these regulations are at the molecular level. So I'll show you some of like the different molecular mechanisms that control the cell cycle. All right, uh, the first thing is, um, this is looking at something called cytoplasmic control. And what that means is, the signals that control when a cell is gonna divide or not divide, one of the main ways that tells a cell like when to start going through cell division are these things called cytoplasmic controls. In other words, there are molecules in the cytoplasma cells that tell the cell, all right, we're gonna go into G2 now. We're gonna go into the M phase now. And an experiment they did to like actually discover that was they took two cells. One cell was in S phase, so it went and it's duplicating its chromosomes. Another cell was in G1. G1 is that first part of the cell cycle. And they fused the cytoplasm. And what they found was the cell that was in G1, when, it, when you fuse the cytoplasm of the cell in S phase, that cell in G1 automatically went through and started doing S phase. So what that would tell you is that there must have been some sort of like controls that tell the cell to like start going through the rest of like, you know, preparing for cell division. And so when you fuse those cytoplasms, those molecular controls, those molecules migrate to this cell and that cell then goes through S phase. Kind of a simple idea. And then they did the same thing with another like M and G1 and they got the same result. The cell that was in M phase, triggers the cell in G1 to start going through um, the rest of uh, you know, the cell, cell cycle. So there you go. And um, yes, yeah, so this is everything I just said in that last slide. Make sure I said everything. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah. The, the idea of like cell cycle control, think of it like a, um, a washing machine. And I don't know how effective this analogy is because I think back to like my AP bio teachers telling me about how washing machines work. It's like, well, as I just told you, like I don't, my mom did my laundry, you know, kind of really. <laughs> but washing machines, like there is sensors there that can like sense like, okay, when the water, you got the right number amount of water in there. There's sensors that, or even a dishwasher, it tells it when to go through the different phases of like how you clean your clothes. And the cell cycle has similar things. There are three main checkpoints to know. There is the G1 checkpoint, the G2 checkpoint, and the M checkpoint. The, uh, the most important checkpoint is the G1 checkpoint. So here, um, you know, we're gonna be checking to see like, is the cell at the right size? 
And in other words, like, have we grown the cell properly to make to have we like made a copy of all the different organelles? Has the cell gotten big enough so we can so that we're ready to like divide that cell in two? Um, uh, size is the main thing. Oh, growth factors. So growth factors, those would be related to those cytoplasmic signals I was just telling you about. Do we have the right combination of growth factors to tell us to move on to that next phase? And then um, the G2 checkpoint. Anybody want to guess, what would the G2 checkpoint do? What would you need to check in G2 that you didn't check in G1? Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, because remember, we just went through S phase. S was synthesis, where we made a copy of the DNA. So you want to check the DNA. That's the main part of uh, that we're doing in G2, is checking that DNA. Oh, in G1, if a, that, uh, this is the main um, checkpoint, meaning if a cell gets through G1, it probably is going to divide. Probably divides. And the reason for that is, I, I mentioned this kind of briefly earlier, that whenever we copy the DNA, we do it with um, very high uh, precision. Like there, it's pretty rare that we make serious errors in copying our DNA where we're gonna have to like, like activate the G2 checkpoint and like kick that cell out. Um, and then, then the M checkpoint. And in the M checkpoint, we're actually doing mitosis. And the main thing is that we wanna check the, um, the spindle, that mitotic spindle. Um, meaning you'll check have the chromosomes attached to the mitotic spindle. Chromosomes attached are in like metaphase, then anaphase, we use the mitotic spindle to pull apart those sister chromatids. So it would make sense that an M checkpoint, you know, it's like you're on a you're at like an amusement park. You don't want to start the ride before you check and make sure everyone's strapped in. That's basically what you're doing in the M check. We're checking and making sure all those uh, sister chromatids are, are attached to the, the mitotic spindle. Okay. If you they weren't attached to the mitotic spindle, then what could happen is you could get two new cells that have the, the wrong number of chromosomes, either too little or too many, and either one of those could lead to some sort of genetic disease. All right. That's, uh, that's about it. Make sure I set everything here. So there are internal and external controls. So um, what I was mainly talking about were the internal controls. Um, so those would be like, uh, you know, the checking that the, the mitotic spindle is correct. Uh, I'll show you some of the other internal, like some of the, the specific cytoplasmic signals that tell the cell when to divide. The external controls we'll talk about later on, um, uh, you know, kind of the second part of the, the lecture. Cool. All right, looking a little more at the G1 checkpoint. Um, as I said, it's the main checkpoint that's going to like determine will the cell go on. What I didn't mention is something called G0. I, I did mention when we went over the, the general cell cycle. These are undividing cells. So if uh, a cell fails to go through the, like the G0, G1 checkpoint, right? So that's a red light, we're going to kick that cell out and make it a non dividing cell. Uh, and then, you know, if there's like really some serious errors with that cell, we might even label that cell for apoptosis. And that's a fancy way of saying cell death. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to pop the cell. We're going to, you know, tell the cell, you know, you can't hang anymore. So, uh, and then, yeah, then if, all right, we check that the growth is, is done properly, we got those growth factors we, we need, um, then we'll move on past the G1 check. So, uh, oh, um, I, the re, they call it the restriction point. I didn't mention that word. Basically, as I said, like if you make it past the G1 checkpoint, you're probably going to divide. So that's why it's the restriction point. It's the main point that we're going to restrict the cells that are going to divide or not divide. Uh, oh, nutrients is another G part of the G1 checkpoint. We want to make sure um, it's kind of related to the cytoplasm. Make sure there's enough nutrients for like when you first like divide those two cells. You know, you don't want to like it's like sending somebody on like a backpacking trip with like no backpack, right? You don't want to like divide a new cell and it has like no nutrients to like survive on its own because then it's like cool, you have two cells, but then one of them is just gonna die because it doesn't have like the the proper nutrients to like kind of like 
get itself going and um, and kind of living and stuff. All right. M checkpoint, not a whole lot more to add here. As I mentioned, it's all about the spindle fiber and making sure those chromosomes are attached to it. And if they're, they're all attached properly, then yeah, then we'll go and pull them apart. And then again, the G2 checkpoint, that's checking the DNA. Make sure that we uh, synthesize that DNA correctly. All right, uh, I mentioned those cytoplasmic controllers, like the cytoplasmic um, regulatory molecules. So uh, examples of those, like they can be like these, these larger protein complexes. A protein complex is multiple proteins together. They can be kinases. I want you to know kinases add phosphates. I'll mention that um, again in unit four, but kinases, they add phosphates. That's a very kind of like, it's an enzyme, um, ACE, right? And uh, it just add, adds phosphate groups. So I just want you to know that. The, the main like cell cycle controllers, they think these things called cyclins. And uh, part of these cyclins, you can have um, a, uh, a cyclin dependent kinase. So I say kinase adds phosphate groups. So a cyclic-dependent kinase would add a phosphate group. So it would add this phosphate group to the cyclin. Once it adds the phosphate group, this then becomes activated. So activated is when that cyclin has a phosphate group. So a cyclin is just a protein that's just like a regulatory molecule. It just goes around and it signals to other parts of the cell to like start preparing for cell division. Uh, I don't. I want to call it an indicator so much. I mean, um, it can be an indicator. I'll, I'll show you a graph of like. There's different kinds of cyclins. They can be an indicator in the sense of like, if you can measure the amount of a cyclin, you know like where the cell's at in the cell cycle. But the main job of the cyclin dependent kinase is just to activate the cyclin. This is trying to activate the cyclin. Yes. So the the uh, well the pro the cyclin dependent kinase is a protein kinase. Oh. This is like this is the this is a kinase. So this whole thing is a like a complex, the cyclin CDK complex. So this is CDK cyclin dependent kinase. It's a kinase that depends on a cyclin binding to it. The cyclin binds to it. This um, this kinase adds the phosphate group to the cyclin, and now that this now that this has the phosphate group, now it's activated. And by this molecule being activated, it can then travel around the cell, telling the cell to like do the rest of like to move on past the G1 checkpoint, to move on past the G2 checkpoint. Uh, when I show you a slide, uh, I got a picture showing a graph of these cyclins, and maybe that might make a little more sense. But just know that there are these kinases that will activate the cyclins. So the CDK activates the cyclin. Um, them combined is called the complex. So let me let me show you that graph. So the cyclins are the main cytoplasmic molecules, and there are different kinds of cyclins. So when we're at the G1 phase. We start getting an increase. We have concentration on the y-axis. We start getting an increase in what's called the G1 cyclin. The G1 cyclin is a uh, regulatory molecule that, again, just goes throughout the cell, communicating the cell to do different things that it needs to prepare for cell division. But then um, once you get to S phase, there's another kind of cyclin called the G1 slash S cyclin that will peak here in between G1 and S phase. The, the point to get from this graph is the cyclins peak at, at different points, at like different points of the cell cycle. Like, so you have a cyclin that will peak during the S phase that's, that's telling the cell, like directing the proteins of the cell to be doing cell division, to synthesize the DNA. We have the M cyclin that peaks at the M phase and that's going around like, you know, signaling like the, the cell to start making say the mitotic spindle and getting the chromosomes attached to that mitotic spindle. Think of these as like, you know, um, like event coordinators. These are just these are just coordinators, right? When it's like, all right, 
G1 cycle and it's your time to like coordinate these activities. And then the G1 cycle gets relieved by the G1S cycling that goes around and coordinates things. So it's just different kinds of coordinators that specialize in different parts of the event. It's the best way I can explain it. Yeah, you could think of like an assembly line. Yeah, like so G1 cycling, it, it's a little more compli complicated than that because as you can see, the G1 cycling technically is present throughout the whole thing. But it kind of is, it makes a little sense with event coordinators. Like there's some event coordinators that like maybe their main job is to like help get the breakfast set up. But it doesn't mean they're like completely off the clock. They just maybe take a more backseat role to like somebody else's like, this might be the person doing the presentation at the event. But does it mean that like G1 just like disappears completely? So you don't have to memorize this graph or anything. I just want you to know they exist. Okay, there are different kinds of cyclins, and they control the cell cycle and what like at what phase we do the different parts of the cell cycle. Okay, and when we get into cancer, what happens in cancer is there's a breakdown in this process. Maybe like um, this cyclin, just like the cancer cell stops responding to that cyclin or it stops responding to this cycle. You know, like there's a, there's a, a complicated, like um, the, these different signals start getting messed up in cancer cells so the cancer cell doesn't divide at the right time. Because as you can see, this is kind of complicated. And that's why cancer is complicated. There's a lot of different things that can go wrong that leads to a cancer cell. So, all right. Um, this is just explaining that the M, um, the M checkpoint, right? Got to make sure that the chromosomes are attached to the mitotic spindle. So um, they do get into a little bit more of the details of it, which is kind of interesting. So once you finally get the, um, the attachment of the mitotic spindle to the kinetic core, remember the kinetic core, like here's a sister chromatid, there's a sister chromatid, here's a centromere, there's a centromere. The kinetic core is a protein complex that's built on the centromere and that's where the mitotic spindle attaches to. Right there. Uh, looks like, like little eyes. Uh, anyways, um, once you get the attachment of the mitotic spindle to the kinetic core like this, that then activates the enzyme separase. Because remember, and I didn't really draw it very well, there's these, there's these things um, called separins, uh, or I'm sorry, cohesins. Cohesins that will help like connect these sister chromatids together. So when we're doing um, cell division during anaphase, we want to separate the sister chromatids. The separase separates, um, it breaks apart these cohesins so that you can finally pull apart the sister chromatids. There you go. Uh, all right, so I mentioned, everything I just mentioned were just internal signals, right? Those cyclins, those are all internal signals. Now we want to talk about external signals. What are signals that can come outside the cell that will tell the cell when to divide and when not to divide? Um, an example that they're showing here is a growth factor. So a growth factor would be an example of some sort of signaling molecule that's coming from outside the cell. Maybe it's released by like some sort of um, organ that's telling like, uh, like uh, cells at a specific part of the body, hey, it's time to grow. So like uh, puberty, growth factor is a big thing. Like a lot of growth factors traveling throughout the, the blood system telling like, hey, it's puberty time. You know, we need to get bigger and stuff. So like growth factor would be a key molecule attaching the cells, telling them to divide. Um, an example of a growth uh, factor is platelet-derived growth factor, PDGF. Um, that's, a, that's a growth factor that um, tells a certain kind of a so-called a fibroblast that it's time to divide. Uh, and I want to show you an experiment that they did with this. To kind of, this is like, how did they did the, discover these growth factors? So what they did was they took a Petri dish of um, connective tissue. Connective tissue like helps hold um, uh, like your skin cells together. And um, uh, you know, if you like, you took it in this, put in this beaker, enzymes, you use that to break up the extracellular matrix. Extracellular, it's outside the cells, that's holding the cells together. So we're gonna break up that extracellular matrix holding the cells together. And then what we're gonna do is we transfer this, um, this culture of cells to either a medium uh, that doesn't have the growth factor without the PDGF, and then we send it to one that, is, that does have the PDGF. So this would be our control. It's a control because we're trying to see what does platelet, 
does platelet-derived growth factor cause cells to grow? So if you, if you try growing those cells on the uh, culture without the PDGF, they don't grow. If you try growing the cells on the uh, culture with the PDGF, the cells grow. Therefore, PDGF causes cells to grow. Pretty simple idea, but you know, they had to make sure that was a thing. All right, so this is, uh, a, this is getting into two other kinds of external growth factors. One of them is called anchorage dependence, and the other is density dependent inhibition. It might sound a little complicated, but the name is telling you what it does. Anchorage dependence, think of an anchor, it like holds a ship into place. Dependence, if you're dependent on something, you require it. So for cells to divide, they require anchorage. Cells need to be anchored to something. In other words, cells just don't just grow just like in a liquid, just like floating around in that liquid. They gotta be anchored to the sides of something. And um, in our body, that's gonna be like that extracellular matrix. Uh, and the purpose of that is like, it helps cells like the tissue, that, that ultimate organ that like the cells make up, function properly if it's anchored to something. So for example, cells have to be anchored to um, some sort of dish surface, and when they do, then they can divide. But the question is, well, how do the cells know when to stop dividing? This is like getting into like density-dependent inhibition. Think of it like social cues, right? Think of like, you think of somebody who doesn't have very good social cues, right? They're like talking too loud. They're just kind of like not operating properly like based on like what the social environment's telling them. Same thing for cells. Cells know when to stop dividing when they start bumping into other cells. And that kind of makes sense, right? This cell right here knows I don't need to keep making new cells because I am surrounded by other cells. So what's going on is there's um, molecules in the cell membrane of each of those cells and they can like sense each other. So there's certain proteins in the cell membrane of all these cells and they sense one another's cells next to it. Okay, they can kind of feel each other next to each other. So that's density dependent inhibition. And you can kind of see that here where if I were to like remove, say I remove that portion of cells and you get, a, you get like a, a, a bald spot, if you will, the cells will then repair that. So that'd be like the idea of a cut, right? You get a cut on your, your skin, uh, your cells around that cut will divide to, to clean that cut up. But your cells don't just keep dividing. That's what happens in a tumor, right? In a tumor, part of what happens is the cells lose that social cues. They lose that density dependent inhibition and they just start dividing and dividing and dividing. And that's what you, um, uh, that's what you see right here. So in a cancer cell, these cells, they just, they don't have that density de dependent inhibition and they also uh, will start losing the anchorage dependence, meaning the cells are just like, they can just keep, the, the cancer cells can just keep dividing, even if they're not very well attached to like the extracellular matrix. Why is that a big deal? Think about that. Why is it a big deal that cancer cells can divide without being anchored to the extracellular matrix? Catherine? It can travel. Right? That then means like, okay, if you have like a cancer cell here, if it, if it had to divide, if it was exhibiting anchorage dependence, it wouldn't travel to other parts of your body. But as soon as cancer cells lose that anchorage dependence, they then metastasize. Metastasize? <laughs> I don't know if I spelled that right. I, I, haven't, read, I haven't written somewhere in the slide. But they, they start moving to other parts of the body. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So then there can be so benign tumors would be would be cells that um, uh, benign tumors they do show the anchorage dependence. They they don't they don't show density dependent inhibition. Like they start like you start you'll get a growth here you know or like wherever the the tumor is growing at, but it isn't really at risk of traveling yet. Benign tumors can turn into malignant tumors. They keep getting more and more mutations because you got to remember like those cyclins and all these other proteins that control the cell cycle, they're ultimately controlled by the DNA. That's the connection between mutations and cancer is the mutations are, are changing the genes that control these regulatory molecules. 
the molecules are controlling like density dependent inhibition and anchorage dependence. Okay. Uh, I should have said, oh, something I didn't mention with like some of the cancer cells, they can make their own growth factor. So the very first external signal I told you about was growth factor. So cell, like, if I give a cell a growth factor and it grows, the opposite is true. If you stop giving cells growth factor, they should stop dividing, right? But what can happen in cancer is you get some of these cancer cells, they, um, they, just, they divide whether or not growth factor is present or not present. And there's a few different things going on, but they can either just like literally synthesize their own growth factor, telling their, their, um, their, their uh, cell to go through the cell cycle, or they can... Um, they, they basically essentially like convey that growth factor signal, signal. They tell the molecules that depend on the growth factor to like keep doing their thing without the growth factor actually binding to the receptor telling the cell to do it, if that makes sense. But, but all of this like falls kind of under the umbrella of an abnormal cell cycle control. So that's kind of the broader thing going on. The cancer cell is just losing control of that cell cycle control system. Those sensors aren't working properly. Uh, some of the other vocabulary, all of those changes, those genetic changes I was talking about, when a cell like has like undergone those, we say the cell has undergone transformation. It's become transformed. Basically, the cell is just like, it's transformed. The DNA has changed. It's no longer responding to the cell cycle appropriately. Um, Oh, our immune system, kind of interestingly, some of, like part of our immune system can detect some of these cells. So part of our, like, the job of our immune system is to detect some of these cells that are losing that like anchorage dependence, they're losing that density dependent inhibition, and they're trying to destroy like those cells. That gets into the apoptosis I was telling you about earlier. So those cells that were, some of those cells that were in G naught, the, the idea of the immune system is, hey, let's destroy those cells so they don't keep undergoing different mutations where they become more serious cancer type cells. But if they don't get eliminated, then they can keep you know, getting into more serious cells. So benign, they stay at the original site. Malignant um, has to do with metastasis. Let me show you a picture of that. Um, and I was not even, I said metastasize, cis, metastasis, classic. Let me show you a picture of it. Uh, so here would be like, here's your tumor growing in like uh, some breast tissue. So here's your tumor growing. This is this would be this like here. This is like the cell not showing um, density dependent inhibition. Density dependent inhibition, right? That's what you see there. So it's like it's growing more than it should, right? It should stop growing. Um, but then what happens is here once the cells can start invading, like start metastasizing to other parts of the body, so you get the metastatic tumor, this is where you lose control of the anchorage dependence. So now this cancer cell has the ability to start dividing um, and it loses its connection to the surrounding like breast tissue and it can travel throughout the body in either the blood vessel or the lymph vessel. I think that might be a little lesser known, but like um, Traveling uh, more or less parallel to your blood vessels are lymph vessels. What does lymph vessels contain? What's the idea of lymph vessels? Like, yeah, you got lymph nodes are related to that. L lymph vessels connect lymph nodes. So what's traveling in the lymph vessel? Luke? Yeah, that lymphatic fluid, it's basically this fluid that has a lot of immune cells. So the purpose of the lymph vessel is like to help transport a lot of your immune cells. Anyways, um, uh, kind of a, like a, I don't know, it's like, I guess nefarious is the word I can only think of, is like some of these cancer cells can also like, uh, they can signal the growth of blood vessels towards themselves. In other words, let's say you have like a clump of like this, this cancerous clump right there. Let's say there's not really blood vessels or lymph vessels near it. There are some cancers that can develop the mutations that will release these signaling molecules that will signal the blood vessel to start growing towards it so that it can then basically climb into that blood vessel and travel to other parts of the body. It's a pretty, pretty scary concept, but that is something that can happen. 
Uh, that's like when they like take like um, a metastatic tumor, a tumor that can spread, and they look at like some of the changes in the, in the DNA that allowed it to be metastatic. That's what they'll see. They'll see like the turning on of certain genes that can cause the growth of blood vessels towards it. Um, anyways, any questions about this? I think we covered everything here. Let me go back here, make sure we got it all. Yeah. So malignant and metastasis, metastasis they go together. Okay. Uh, oh, getting to some cancer treatments. So um, if, a, uh, if a tumor is more benign, really if a tumor is more benign, that's when you can just really use like just radiation, right? You got a, you got a tumor there. You could do also some surgery. You can do more, a more localized treatment because the cancer is like right there, right? You can like target the radiation and the radiation is, a, is of a certain kind that it, it helps like target the cancer cells more than our normal cells. But if you have um, the metastatic tumors, those tumors, uh, those cancerous cells that lost that anchorage dependence and they can start traveling to other parts of the body, then we have to use chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy, if you know somebody undergoing chemotherapy, that's how you know like their cancer's gotten a more serious point. And um, there's a lot of different kinds of chemo uh, therapeutic drugs. Some of them they'll like, they'll target different, different parts of the cell cycle. But um, what they mainly are targeting, like the, the kind of the more common thread of like uh, chemotherapeutic drugs is they, they target cells that divide frequently. And think about it. I showed you like the, the rate of cells that divide frequently. And I said most of them were like skin cells, your digestive cells. So why the chemotherapy drugs target cells that divide frequently is cancer cells divide frequently. But so do your skin cells and your digestive um, cells. That's why people, and your immune cells, that's why people who are, who are undergoing chemotherapy, that's why you get like the hair loss because of like, you know, the skin cells, uh, you know, like that control like hair growth. Those are like being killed by the chemotherapy drugs. That's why you get like um, like stomach issues because we're killing off more of those cells that are in your digestive tract. And uh, they're like immunocompromised, meaning they, uh, they're very, um, uh, their immune system as a whole doesn't work very well because those chemotherapy drugs, yeah, they're killing the cancer cells, but they're also killing some of, the, some of our uh, uh, other immune cells. So it's like chemotherapy or drugs, it's not, chemotherapy is not really like, like it's kind of a trade-off, right? It's like the cancer is going to kill you and may perhaps some of these other issues like are really inconvenient, but like that's kind of the trade-off we're trying to target like those cancer cells. So the future of like cancer treatment is getting into personalized medicine. So we have a better understanding of like DNA. We can like, it's cheaper for us to like sequence DNA and maybe we could like take a sample of like, hey, you got, you got cancer, we could take, a, the, take a, a sample of that cancerous tumor, analyze the genes that got changed in that cancerous tumor, and then we know, okay, for those, um, those mutations, we know that this kind of like cocktail of chemotherapeutic drugs, those work better at targeting just those cancer cells, and bless you, and maybe they don't, they don't target your skin cells quite as much. So that's kind of the future of trying to improve, like improve um, cancer treatments is trying to make it more personalized to your specific cancer. And they already can kind of do that with like, say like breast cancer. They have a better understanding of like these specific genes go wrong more often than not in breast cancer. So these drugs work better in patients with breast cancer. I think that's the last slide. Is there, is there any questions on any of this stuff? Okay.